All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Let's uh, let's have prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to get together. We thank you, Father, for just uh, the, the fellowship. We thank you for that uh, that that brother and sister love that we got here. And, and, and Father, we we just ask you, Lord, that you would bless that tonight. We ask that you would just open your word, that you would speak to us in a clear and a fresh manner. Father, for those that are watching with us online, Father, that you would speak to them just as much as you speak to us here. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guys, if you're watching, welcome. This is week four in our study of the rise and fall of Ephesus. And uh, we are not having handouts tonight, so I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and get something to write on. And get your Bibles and get ready uh, for everybody here. Go ahead and grab one of those white, those clear sheets of paper. It is time to break some stuff out. Uh, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write down up to five things that have stood out to you or has made an impression on you thus far in this study. And and what we're doing is we're looking at the, uh, for, for, for Lisa, if you and Carrie, what we're doing is we're looking at the actual beginning, the, the planting of the, the Ephesian church, how it was happened, what took place, and what took place with the fall, and how it ended in Revelation chapter 2. What, from the beginning point to Revelation 2 is where we're at. This is our journey, okay? So that's where we are. So write down up to five things, or you can write down more, go ahead and do that, but up to five things that have stood out to you or have made an impression, uh, and if you've not been with us, uh, and if you have not been with us uh, online, write down things that you know about the book of Ephesus as well, that, uh, or not the book of Ephesus, but the, the, the church of Ephesus. Uh, and just also for you folks that are watching online, it is going to be very difficult for me to answer your questions. But if you want to go ahead and leave your questions, I'll get to them after the broadcast is over. Up to five things that have stood out to you, made an impression on you. Maybe you knew it, maybe you didn't know it. Uh, the maps were handed out week one. We are going to be looking at the maps tonight. There's, there's some things on there that we need to uh, identify. So uh, just some things, and we're not going to take a whole lot of time uh, so what I, we're going to do is we're going to start at the, the table over here with Danny and Pam, and we're going to kind of work our way around and just share uh, one thing. And it doesn't have to be the thing. It's just something that has stood out to you or made an impression on you. Miss Danny, g g give us one thing. The very first thing was that there were nine letters written to the church or including a message to the church in Ephesus, nine. Nine. That, so they, it, they definitely were important. That's right. That's right. And that does not include that is, does not include the beginning of the church in Acts, or it does not include the letter in Revelation. So nine separate documents. Okay, that's great. That's that's great. Okay, Pam, give give us one thing. Okay. Um, they apparently did not completely check out or compare whatever the the doctrines of all the speakers in their church because they allowed false doctrine to slip in. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely did that. No doubt about that. Okay, Nisi, one thing. Sorry, I was saying how they Oh, okay, okay, no problem. I'll keep going. Miss Andy, one thing. That's what I was going to say. The absence of false doctrine and teaching that was going on. Yeah. Yeah, it was just crazy. And the, the, the worship of false gods. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Mr. Bill, anything? Okay, that's no problem. That's no problem. Johnny. They were evidently more concerned with their economic status than they were their spiritual status. Yeah. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were. Dana? Just looking back at all these 20 different pagan temples and all that. Yeah. 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 Yes, it was. Uh, and that's plus the big one. You know, that's yeah. plus the one to, to the, the Greek goddess Diana. Um, uh, uh, Lisa or Carrie, what, what's something that you remember out of the book of Ephesians? Uh, and the church that has kind of stood out to you. Well, just from from earlier times, you know, when we looked at the book, um, one of the verses that comes to mind is where it talks about um, who we are in Christ. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and knowing who we are and walking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. worthy of 
who we are. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the entire first chapter is that. The entire first chapter. Please. Okay, Carrie, anything? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, when we left off last week, when we left, and like I said, and there's more, if you want to keep writing, go ahead, go ahead and do that. Uh, when we left off last week, we were in Acts 20, verse 1. So go ahead and get your Bibles, and that's where we're going to be, 20, verse 1. Acts 20, verse 1, give everybody an opportunity to get there. Like I said, we're going to look at the maps here just in a little bit. When we left in Acts 20, 21, Paul was leaving Ephesus for the last time. The Ephesian church herself would never, ever see Paul again. And the year, does anybody remember approximately what year this was? We've talked about this. What was the year? It's in my notes. It is. It should be in your notes. Yes. Keep backwards. Yeah, keep going back. 57 A.D. It was approximately 57 A.D. That's right. It was approximately 57. Okay. Let's read. Let's go back. Verse 20. And let's, let's start there. After the uproar had ceased. Now, what was the uproar? Let's identify the uproar. What was the uproar? Over the silversmiths. Over the silversmiths. Right. They had thrown the, throwed the fit. And it was so many of them, they had to go to the theater in order to gripe and complain and throw their hissy fits. Okay, and, and that had all been calmed down. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself. Now, we said that these disciples are here are the ones that he had met and that he had taken the extra mile with to clarify John the Baptist teachings versus now that of Christ. So he had clarified all that up. And that's who these men are. He embraced them and he departed to go to where? Macedonia. Where do we know is in Macedonia? We just left there. You just left there in Sunday school. Philippi. Okay? Okay. Let's talk about the mental state of the church at this point with Paul leaving. If you're part of the Ephesian church, how are you feeling right now? Remember, he's been there pretty close to three years. How, how are you feeling with Paul leaving? A little lost. Okay. A little lost. What else? What else? <coughs> Probably fearful. What, what's going to happen to us without leadership? Okay. That's good. Well, what? You think Paul's place that would be a huge yeah. job. Yeah. Well, and he yeah. Lived. yeah. He lived. Well, now you, we also have to remember, he's nothing more than a missionary. He's an evangelist, mm -hmm. okay? Because he's now at that point, he's teaching every day in that school of Tyrannus, and there are leaders in each of the house churches. Mm -hmm. Well, Doctor Jones, did you get it in? <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. I'm glad you're still in one piece. Come on in Come here. On in. Okay. <laughs> In Acts 20, verse 2, let's go ahead and look. Acts 20, verse 2. When he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Okay, so he is now on the road. I want you to take your maps out or get a copy of your map, and let's look. And I want you to look at the very tip-top left-hand corner, okay? The very tip-top left-hand corner. Now... You see Pergamum, and then you see Mytilene. Everybody see that? Okay. If you were to draw, all right, and I'm going to walk around to each table. If you were to draw a little extra land mass, you're going to see two different towns. Okay, and I'm going to come around and come this way. Right here, Steve. I'm going to let you see that. Okay, see it at the very top? Mm-hmm. Okay. See two different land masses. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Two different land masses. You got it, Doctor. Let me see that one. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'm gonna tell you what they are. What are the two? Uh, I'll tell you that in just a minute. Just the two you got. Just your dots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All over the other one. Okay. All right. Show everybody up here. This is in an upper left hand corner. So that we can see. We're just adding, this is all still the land mass that's coming up there. I'm just drawing it out. Okay. So put your dots on your map. Okay. Or use those if you do. 
Okay. Now, the reason why we want to do this, the reason why we want to identify this, okay, the reason why we want to do this is in verses 20, or excuse me, in chapter 20, verses 2 through 15, Paul goes on into Macedonia and he spends quite a bit of time in a town called Troas. And Troas is the one at the very tip top. Okay? Troas is the one at the top. That's that top city. Troas. Okay? In verse 3, we see that he stayed in there three months. Okay? And we can read on down verse, uh, in verse 6. It says that we sailed away from Philippi after the days of the unleavened bread. And in five days... Joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. And so we don't know how exactly long this trip was once he sailed out of Ephesus. But can we all get on the same page and say that we can now measure it in months? This is measurable in months now. Okay? So he has now been gone several months. But we again, we just don't know where. Okay? As Paul is leaving Troas, he sends his crew on to sail to that second dot I showed you, which is the town of Asos, A-S-S-O-S. -S -S. But now, while he sends his crew to sail from Troas to Asos, he says he's going to walk it. He's going to take it by foot. So let's look at verse 13. This is all in chapter 20. All in chapter 20. Verse 13, then we went ahead to the ship. Now, who is we? Who's writing? Who's writing? Dr. Luke is writing. Exactly. Okay. So we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos. So Dr. Luke is with the crew and sailed to Asos. They're intending to take Paul on board for so he had given orders intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Asos... We took him on board and came to Mytilene. Now, on your maps, this is already there. In your upper right-hand corner over in this little green dot, you've got Mytilene. Everybody see that? This is Mytilene. It's already on your map. Okay? Everybody got that? Okay. So he is there with his crew. We know Dr. Luke's there and there's several others that's there. It's irrelevant who's with him at this point. Okay. Meets him at Asos. They sail to Mytilene. And there they make a couple of extra stops during the next few verses. Okay. Let's read verse 15 and 16. We sailed from there and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Tregillium. The next day we came to Miletus. Now, Miletus, if you will look, is down here. Okay, I'm going to start over here. Miletus is right here. Okay. Miletus is down here in this part. It's down here, close to that, that red dot over on where, where, where what's his name, John was staying. We're close to Patmos. Okay, everybody find my leaders? Okay. So they sailed, just for the record, okay, so that everybody knows, this journey, he ends up up here, goes to Asos, comes over to Middle East. After a couple of other stops, they sail the Aegean Sea, and they land at Miletus. Notice they had to pass by Ephesus. Everybody see that? They had to sail past Ephesus. Okay. He intentionally passed Ephesus. Look at verse 16 now. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so let's just understand what's going on here. He wanted to go to Jerusalem, he wanted to be there for the day of Pentecost, and he knew that if he stopped at Ephesus, he was not going to make a short trip out of it. He was going to stay for a while. He loved Ephesus. He loved those people. But while he is at Miletus, he couldn't get 
Ephesus. He couldn't get that, that Ephesian church out of his mind or out of his heart. Look at verse 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Now, we see the distance on the map. To make it specific, it is 36 miles from Miletus to Ephesus by foot. 36 miles. He calls for who? He calls for the elders. Who are? They are the pastors of the house churches in Ephesus. We do understand, and just so that we're all on the same page, we're not talking about the Ephesian church being a big complex like this. We're talking about scattered churches that meet in homes around this city. Okay, How big was the city? Do we remember how big the city was? This is huge. Yeah, it's approximately a quarter of a million people. Okay. So we don't know how many house churches there were. Which means we don't know how many men came. But the thing is, is that he sends for the elders. He sends for the leaders, the pastors of the churches to meet him. So the thing we have to understand is that this is not an all church meeting. In other words, all the Christians of Ephesus did not make this trip. Just those in pastoral roles. And they made this 36 mile journey. Now I want to just, just real briefly. There is a difference between an all-church meeting when all of, of, of uh, Christians are like for our association. When all the association gets together, like what we did this past Monday. When we all get together and that of just pastors. Okay, When pastors get together, it's, it, the whole demeanor changes in a good way. Why? Why? Share the same experiences. Yes, we share the identical same experiences. We share the same heart. We share the same mindset. We share the same calling. And so the conversations are different. The, the intensity of the conversations are different. Sometimes we, 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 we just share and we encourage one another. Sometimes we just allow somebody to vent because they've been hurt. Somebody may be discouraged and we let them just, just talk about the things that's happened in their church because, number one, they know it's going to be you know, ultra confidential. And they also want to know that every one of those guys that's around that table understands exactly where they're coming from. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's a unique thing. I love pastors' gatherings. I really do. These are men of one heart and one mind and one mission. And when we talk about this group, we're talking about Paul, who is the man who went to Ephesus to begin the church. We know he's been there, you know, roughly three years. We know he has a great relationship with these elders, with these leaders. And so they have one mission in mind. And I think we can describe the mission that they had was to literally turn Ephesus upside down with the gospel. And I would say they were doing it. Would you all agree? I mean, they were tearing it up. It was, it was revival taking place in Ephesus. Okay. What I want us to do right now is I want us to put ourselves inside the meeting room where Paul and these Ephesian elders are at. They're probably gathered around on a dirt floor. They're probably as close to Paul as they possibly can. Because they did not think they were going to see him again, right? Back from the beginning of verse 20. Or the beginning of chapter 20. So now that they've got an extra blessing, and I can imagine that they are going to hang on to every word. And so here's what I want you to do. All right? I'm going to read several verses of this conversation of Paul pouring out to these elders. I'm going to do my best to read it slower than normal. And what I want you to do is I want you to, just briefly, I want you to write down the things that you hear Paul say. And I also want you to write down the things that you don't hear Paul say. What is he telling them but what is not there? 
And I want you to pay particular attention to the details that Dr. Luke writes with. Okay? Here we go. Starting at verse 18. Now, you don't have to just follow along with me verse by verse. I want you to listen to the conversation of Paul as he's pouring out his heart. <clears throat> what do you hear him say? What do you hear missing? And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. And here's what he says with that statement. He says, I do not count my life of any value. That's what he said there. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you, or excuse me, to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Words of Paul to a room full of elders. Now just think about those words for just a minute. What did you hear him say? Anybody? What did you hear him say? He had opposition. Okay. <clears throat> did he identify it? To the Jews. Okay. Good. Good. What else? What did you hear him say? He told him that the Holy Spirit had warned him of what was ahead. And we kind of knew that with Paul's knowledge of wherever he went, he was going to have issues. All right. Good. What else? He served with humility. He proclaimed the truth. Okay. Okay. Uh, Counts himself as valueless in the, to run the race. What else? What, did, the of what did you hear him say? What is he saying to these men? What did you hear him say to the men? He the warned them of, of, of being attacked after he left. I'm he sorry? That, he warned them of being attacked after he's gone. Well, we, we didn't get to that yet. And the Holy he warned them, well, let's see. He reminded them that the Holy Spirit had made them overseers of the church that Christ purchased with his blood. Right. Right. Exactly. John? He was being compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, not knowing what was going on. What was it? When he got there. That's right. The Lord, I got to go. I don't know what's there, but I got to go. Yeah, it didn't sound like he wanted to go or was looking forward to it. He, his full intention was to get there by the day of Pentecost. That was his whole thing. It's something was triggered. Okay. What did you hear him say? I heard uh, he taught everybody. No bias. He, he included everyone. Okay, good. Good. 
What else? With anybody else. So by example, I would think he would be saying, you shouldn't be here. You do the same thing, right. Okay. Good. He said his life didn't matter, period. He said his life didn't matter. His life didn't matter. He just had to yeah. keep preaching the gospel. That's right. That's right. What else? What did you hear? Remember, remember, he's talking, he's talking to other pastors. He's pouring his heart out to men who are leading churches in Ephesus, and we've already described what the city is like, and this is the last time he's going to see them. This is the last conversation he has. I like where he talked about finishing with joy. Okay. Even though he'd already been through so much, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit was already revealing that he was going to have more problems, Good. he talked about finishing with joy. Good, good, yeah. good. What else? And that none of those things, the tribulation that awaited him, none of that would move him. Yeah, yeah. 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 Didn't, didn't spoof him at all. Okay, anything else? And then I'm going to give you a list of things that he said. He's pretty confident he's not returning either because he says no one's going to see him again. Yeah, yeah. in other words, guys, you need to hear, it was also a sense of urgency with that, that statement. Like, guys, you need to hear what I'm saying because I'm not coming back. This, this is it. Okay? Now let me give you what I have. Okay? I want you to notice that he switched from being the missionary and the church planter to that of the pastor. Because he talked to them as a pastor. Did you catch that? The tone changed. The whole tone changed. Paul sees himself as an example of a follower of Christ. And he wants them to notice his example, but don't be like him, be like Christ. We talk about the humility. He reminds them that he didn't live like a celebrity. He just wanted to serve the Lord. And to serve with humility. He was very clear to not only teach all people, as Lisa has brought out, but he also didn't cherry pick what he taught. He didn't teach just certain topics. He said, I kept nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. And he didn't just come up and tell you or to briefly whisper to you. He proclaimed it. Paul also reminded them, and he reminds us, he was all-encompassing. He went house to house, which is another confirmation of the house church. Would it have been nice to know how many house churches there were? God would have known that. He talks about his future, but he's not worried about his future. Did you notice that he considered his ministry as a race? He's running the race. Always. Trying to win the race. As Johnny pointed out, it confirms that he would not be back in Ephesus. And I I like I like 26. I like verse 26. Let me read it again. 26 and 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned or I have not avoided to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What Paul is saying here is he is declaring that his heart is clear. He knew and he was at peace that he could leave these Ephesian Christians to God's care with good conscience knowing that he had, and this is his words, not shunned to declare to them the whole counsel of God. He encouraged them Therefore, take heed to yourselves. He encouraged them to pay attention to their own life. I hear this a lot, and it's hard. This is one of the things that's do as I say and not as I do because I don't do it well. But a pastor or a teacher cannot pour from an empty cup. Can't do it. The pastor has to be filled just as much, and he is reminding them of that. He said, pay attention to the flock. The two words I want us to hear is feed and lead. Feed them and lead them. Feed them and lead them. And something else that he says here is, remember that the church doesn't belong to you. 
It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Jesus because he purchases it with his own blood. Probably why we don't know how many house churches there were in Ephesus. Yeah. That wasn't the main thing. Yeah, it wasn't the main thing. Or how many members each church had. That's right. Didn't matter. And if you'll notice, we don't know the names of the elders. It was irrelevant. It was irrelevant. What didn't you hear? What didn't you hear? Complaining. There was no complaining whatsoever. Fear. There was no fear whatsoever. What else? What didn't you hear? No hesitancy. There was no hesitancy. What else? Regret. There was no regret. What else? See, now, does this make a difference to you when you understand this, 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 this meeting? The thing comes alive now. Give me a couple other things. What didn't you hear? And I'm going to tell you a couple of things. What didn't you hear? Anybody? Definitely no defeat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. There was no defeat whatsoever. He didn't boast about himself. He didn't boast about himself. No, not at all. No ego. <laughs> yeah, 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 there was no ego whatsoever. Yeah. Did you notice there was not a single word about the false teachers? Not a single word. Why do you think that was? I'm glad you asked that. I'll, I shall get to that. He didn't say a single word about the idol worship. That was rampant in this city. And nor did he say a single word about the demon possessed people. Not a word. Which means he focused on what I'm going to call the real. He focused on the positive. Now, I don't know how much time we'll have to get around to do this, but I'm going to do this. I have two brand new dollar bills that's never as you can see they've never been creased they've never been bent okay one is different one is different than the other okay and so i'm going to pass these around and let you look the only thing i'm going to ask you to do is not crinkle them because I, I like straight up bills like this but i'm going to ask you just to look at them and see if you might find a difference. And if you do, don't tell anybody at your table. Just maybe make a note. And I'm going to start over here with Miss D. Okay? Okay. If you study the real thing enough, yeah. you can recognize the character. See, here, here's the deal. And that's exactly what I was going to, exactly what I was going to say. Is the Treasury Department of the United States, their habit when they train new people is they will put the newbies in a room and they will hand them denominations of every bill available that is real. And they will tell their newbies, know these bills like the back of your hands. And I'm sure bank people are done pretty close to the same way. And the reason they do that is because they want their people in the Treasury Department, bank people, they want them focused on what is real and what is not real. And if they know what is real, then everything else identifies as false. Okay? Everything else identifies. But you can't do that until you study the real deal. Which what Paul was saying here, and this is why he wasn't talking about the false teachers here, is he was laying out to them the truth and, and, and what was real, and that was what they needed to focus on. And if they focused on that, then these false teachers, these idol worshipers, and that idol worship that was going on in the city, and all of those demon-possessed morons that was out there in the city would be quickly identified. Does that make sense? What do you think, Ms. Denny? I didn't find anything except numbers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's not, not what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. It's a, 
it, it, it's a pretty interesting test. And, and I've talked to people who have gone through that training, and they're like, you think you're going to lose your mind that you look at Bill so much that everything runs together. But then at, there's a moment in it that everything clicks, and you're like, oh, I get it, because now that stands out as fake or as whatever. Okay. Rita Johnson could probably find it. Oh, I guarantee you in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. Focusing on the real. So, while we're trying to pass that around, okay. I know which one's real, which one's kind of fit. Okay. <laughs> You're going to need to tell me how, okay? Mm -hmm. what, I, what I now want you to do is now I want you to be thinking now about what we just read in this pastor's meeting, in this elder's meeting, because that's the name of our study tonight is the elder's meeting. What did he say now? What is Paul wanting from these elders now? What is he wanting from these elders? Who wants to share I think he didn't mention all these other negative issues going on because they were not a problem but a symptom of the problem. Yeah. That's right. Problem. Yeah. Sin. Yeah. You see, here, here, here's the thing, and you're, you're, you're spot on. False teachers are not the problem. Okay? False teachers are not the problem. Idol worship is not the problem. Okay. Idol worship is not the problem. And I'm even going to go so far as to say demon-possessed people are not the problem. And Paul knew it. And this is why it was critical that you understand the real. Do you think you found it? Don't think up. I think he wanted them to stay focused. Yeah. Not to lose focus. Yeah, not to lose. Not to lose focus. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Had they been like the Bereans where they tested everything they were told, they would have known the difference. They would have known the difference. That's right. But instead, these were newbies that were still trying to learn. Now, you, you also have to know that you know, some of these Christians is quite possible because we've got the letters from First and Second Peter that's going there. You you need to know that there were possibly some of those early Christians that were saved on the day of Pentecost that were in this area. So you've got now some long term Christians because if now we're looking at the year eighty fifty seven, then you've got to to take for granted that you've possibly got some senior adult. Christians that are in Ephesus. But it wasn't until you begin to see these events in Acts 18, 19, 20 that you see the organization of the church and the church comes through. So it's pretty pretty unique. It is pretty unique when you see that. But had they had they put it to question, they would not have done it. So that tells us that the length of time between the day of Pentecost and when Paul got there around you know, 53, 54 AD then there was some falling away from the church, right? Or falling away from the way. Miss Andy, found it? No? Okay. Okay. While we're still looking, I'm going to move on. Okay. He changes gears and he changes an intensity level in verse 29. Okay. He's just poured his heart out. But now he's going to change gears. Verse 29. Paul says this. For I know this. That after my departure. Savage wolves. Will come in among you. Not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves. Men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Notice he starts it 
after my departure. After my departure. Why is that statement so important? After my departure. Because even the demons identify and know Paul. Okay. Okay. But because it's up to them. Yeah. It's, he's not going to be there to take care of it. It's up to them. Okay, good, good, good. What else? They're going to have to be real. Why? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like this is Paul saying, after my departure, guys, it's your turn to lead. This is y'all. This is y'all. You're the leader of your church. You've got to do this. You've got to stand up. What else? What else does this statement say? Is he talking about his departure from Ephesus or this world? At this point, he's talking about his departure from Ephesus. Or away from them that he would not see. Yes. Well, he pointed out to them that they'd be attacked from outside and within. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Glad you caught that. So that tells us what about people in our church? You need to be careful in allowing members in. That and that is critical in churches. You cannot just allow any. Billy Bob or Susie Sue come in and take them in as a member, you have to understand, especially, I mean, if they're coming from another church, what do you believe? What is your doctrine? I think a lot of churches are guilty of that in our day and time. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. After my departure. Okay. After my departure. What else does he say here? Okay. What does he say? Let's read it again. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. You see, what we've got here is Paul switched from tenderness in that first section that we looked at, and he's switching to a sense of urgency. And to be real honest with you, okay, this is what a lot of churches don't understand. And this is critical in churches today. The majority of churches only see their pastor as the shepherd, okay? And he is indeed the shepherd. But the truth is, is that in fact he is not just the shepherd, he is also the sheep dog. And so in addition to feeding and leading the flock, he is to defend and to protect the flock. And that is up to that elder, that is up to that pastor. That role of his is to be able to identify what Paul is now calling savage wolves that's either coming in from the outside or rising up from the outside. Or rising up from the inside. Okay. Pastors are sheepdogs. And a lot of people today don't understand that. They don't understand that. They expect, you know, one side of the preacher when in, indeed he is just as responsible to identify that fakeness, that falseness that's trying to rip and tear and harm the flock. He has to identify that. And what was their motivation? What is the motivation of the savage wolves? It tells us there to draw away the disciples after themselves. And so the pastor has always got to be alert to these attacks. He can never sit back and just go. Now, now I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? Now, this is Jim's opinion. This is Jim Theology 101, so you can, you, you can put a quarter with it and get some bubble gum, okay? But this is my theology. I believe that verses 29 and 30 are a glimpse. Did you find it? Well, I know they're different. Okay. I know they're different. Did you find the difference? I see the difference you, in one of them. In one of them? Okay. Okay. I believe that these two verses are a precursor into Paul's letter to the Ephesians that he's going to write in 26 years. Okay. Why would I say that? Why would I say that? Because Paul in Ephesians gave us the spiritual armor, how to fight against it. Keep going deeper. And how to resist the attacks of the enemy and fight off. Keep going deeper. Um, somebody, somebody jump in and help. 
Why, why do I believe these two verses are the precursor to Ephesians? Why do I believe that? Why do I believe that? Because this is what happened. It is what happened, but specifically, how can we tie it together? How can we tie it together? Anybody? Okay. What does he say in verse 29? He says, the savage wolves, then he says this, will come in among you. Now, are we talking about a wolf that roams around out here in the forest? Nope. No. No. So what are we talking about? A wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay. Which? Fake Christians. Okay. In verse 30, he also says, from among yourselves. So savage wolves will come in, savage wolves among yourselves. And again, I ask the question, are we talking about, find it, Johnny? Are we, are we talking about the wolves that are out here in the field as compared to something else? The answer is no. And here's why I believe it's tied together. How did Paul warn the Ephesians when he was detailing the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6? How did he warn them? There was a warning. They come to destroy the three days, whatever. That's not it. I can go ahead and stop you there. Okay. okay. Yeah. How did he warn the Ephesians? His warning was this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And so he's identifying back here in Acts 20 verse 19. That those savage wolves that will come in among you. And those that will come in among yourselves. Are not the problem. See where I'm coming from? Does that make sense? They are not the problem. That's why I said a while ago, false teaching is not the problem. The, the out of worship is not the problem. So what is the problem? It's our, it's our enemy. Yeah, he has totally set up our, our guide into Ephesians chapter 6. For like not. Yep. Yep. Okay, so when we now, we're through this, okay, verse 31, what he's going to do is he's going to switch back to his tender side, okay? Verse 31, and we're going to read through 36, verse 31, therefore, watch, and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands, talking about his hands, that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. His entire focus in these verses is for the elders, for the pastors, is to have a heart of sacrifice. And I can honestly say that every pastor's meeting that I have ever been blessed to attend from the beginning of my ministry, even through today, ends the way verse 36 does. We will all kneel if possible, but we will gather together around one another and we will pray for one another. We will, we will pray not only for, over one another, we will pray for each one's specific problems and we will pray for their churches. That's why I love pastors meetings. 
And that's why I think this is so critical to the, the life of the Ephesian church. Now, verses 38 and 39 is the final goodbye. Let's go ahead and read. Then they all wept freely, and they fell on Paul's neck. They were just, they were just hovering over him, and they kissed him, sorrowing, most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and then they accompanied him to the ship. Now, this was a highly emotional farewell. They would see no more glimpses of Paul. And in fact, we do not hear anything else from the Ephesian church until Paul's letter to them some three to six years later. So from this moment until the first words in Ephesians 1.1, we don't know what's going on in Ephesus. So what went on during that time? What went on? Exactly what he warned them during about. that time. False teachers and savage wolves. Savage wolves. Came in. Mm -hmm. Came in. I don't think they were prepared, to be honest. What else? What else? What do you think happened? They lost their first love. What do you think, Lisa? <laughs> the only bank <laughs> worker. <laughs> I don't see it. You're fired. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna share you I wanna share this with you. And then, then we'll talk about the dollar bills. Okay? I want to give you some final thoughts from the origins of the Ephesian church. Okay, final thoughts. Number one, Paul spent more time here than in any other church. And we've talked about that, but I think it's pretty special that we understand it. He spent more time physically in Ephesus than he did in any other church that we see in the New Testament, especially those that he uh, he, he, he planted and that he wrote it. Okay, so something had to be very special about Ephesus to Paul. Okay. Number two. He was determined to not let the teaching and the preaching of the Gospels be stopped. Nothing stopped him. In fact, if you remember that uprising that come on with Demetrius about all of the stopping of the purchasing of the silver idols that were that were being being made to go to the worship of, of, of Artemis and all that was going on and there were so many of them that they wanted them out of the streets and they take them to the treasury. What did Paul want to do? He wanted to go preach. He wanted to go in there to them. Nothing was going to slow down the preaching of the gospel. Second, and I want you to think about this for just a minute, okay? And by the way, we have tore up Acts 19 and 20. Would y'all agree with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have totally ripped this thing apart. We do not see Paul himself doing any, quote, healing of the sick or casting out demons. Do we? We don't see it. We don't see it. We don't see him doing anything, any meetings, nobody bringing people to him of healing the sick or casting out demons through those unusual miracles that were mentioned in chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. You remember that? All of that took place. You remember there was so much that if they could just get a handkerchief or an apron that Paul had and they could lay it on somebody, then it would heal the sick or that it would cast the demons out. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. But that wasn't in the church. No, but it, it wasn't Paul. Yeah. Now he was, he was, he, he, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he triggered it, but it wasn't him personally doing it. Okay? Okay. So even though we don't see Paul doing any of this. We don't see, and let's ask this question, do we see Paul himself encountering any demons himself in Ephesus? No. No. But yet, in chapter 19, 
verse 15 in Ephesus when the Ghostbusters tried to do their thing, those itinerant Jewish exorcists, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. And who are you? Even though we know that Paul did not engage in them in any way. So the demons knew Paul, even though there was no direct engagement that we have documented here. So what does that tell us? What does that tell us? You gotta be real. What does it tell us? What does it tell us? Is Say it that again. Is it because he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, just as we are, and the demons recognize that? Keep that thought. Okay. Nowhere in the three years that we have Paul in Ephesus do we see him encountering a demonic spirit. Nowhere. We know demons were cast out during that time, but Paul was not directly encountering it. Okay. But during one of those encounters that Paul was not there, in Acts 19 verse 15, they had in Ephesus something, a group of people called itinerant Jewish exorcists. And these are people that thought they could get them out. And so these men encountered a demon-possessed man. Okay. And they come to him, and this is what they said. We come to you and we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now that's how they encountered it. Notice, they didn't know Jesus personally. But they're taking it upon themselves that they can cast him out by what? Paul's Paul. preaching. And the demon responds to them in this manner. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then scripture says that the, the d demonic spirit proceeded to beat the snot out of them and literally beat their clothes off of them, beat them naked. And so we know that happened. But Paul didn't encounter them personally. But they know it. So what does that tell us today? That you don't have to encounter somebody personally to impact them. Keep, keep going. Come on. Don't try to cast out demons. No, 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 no. no. Come on. Come on. The, Come demon, on. the demons will not respond to anyone who doesn't have well, let me Let me tell you something. The minute, the minute that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you just went on Satan's most wanted list. Mm -hmm. But he can't touch you without the Holy Spirit's permission. Oh, can you? Well, it, you, it does Think give you the thought of, you know, Jesus they knew and Paul they knew. Right. First, the first thing it tells me is that's a no touch to them. Well, they can tempt you. But oh, they no, no, they can. No, they attack. They can attack you. Yeah. It's like they attack believers. Yeah, but I'm talking about. That it was a no-no to the demons right. to touch yeah. Jesus or Paul. Yeah, the thing is, though, is that they can identify who Jesus was. They can identify the power of Jesus in Paul. But they didn't identify these itinerant exorcists right. because they did not have the power of Jesus inside them. Right. And so if, if you are a believer and you have the power of Jesus inside you, then these demons know you and they know you by name. And we have that documented when they go to Jesus to ask for who? Simon Peter in order to what? Sift him as wheat. We also can go back to the Old Testament when they went and they asked for who by name? Job. They went and asked for Job. So if you are a born again baptized believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ and you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you are on Satan's wanted list by name. So he didn't have to encounter them for them to know him. Right. Which so means that they had to we, ask they had to ask permission to sift Paul. Yeah, they had to ask permission. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is they can't you know, they can attack you and tempt you and all that stuff, but they really have to have permission. Well yeah, they could have permission, yeah, yeah. But, but they that, that's not the point. The point is is that they knew him. The whole point is that they knew him. So what would you add to these final thoughts?
of Ephesus before we get to the two dollar bill. We have to stay focused. Pay attention. Okay, what else? What would you add? You can't allow anything and everything in their churches. That's right. That's right. Okay. Who thinks they found it? Pam did? I think so. Okay. Carrie, did you? Well, on the, on the reverse side. On this side? No. The, the, yeah, the side that you just showed. It. The side that you just showed. It. This side? One of them's got a black, almost looks like a partial fingerprint on it. Okay. On this side? Yeah. Okay. That is wrong. That is not okay. the difference. Okay. Okay, what did you think? Okay. To me, the material mm -hmm. was different. You know, okay. the, the, the actual dollar bill was made out of not, not paper, but a, a, what, linen or whatever it is. Okay. Okay. And also, his jacket, George Washington's jacket, mm -hmm. you could feel the ridges yep. really clearly in one of them more so than the other. That's pretty good. That's not it. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's what I noticed. I'm going to show the banker. <laughs> I'm not a banker. I'm an HR professional. <laughs> Was okay. it something to do with the eye and the pyramid? I didn't even have no. time to look at no. that stuff. That is blackened in in the circle. That is not. You're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. See it? Uh -huh. You have to do something minute. That yeah. is the difference. Mm hmm. And it's only that one. It's not. That, that's it. That is the only difference. There are two of them and only one. And only one is covered. Wow. That is the so only thing that I did. Really? So here's, here's what I've done. Right here. This one, this is covered in <laughs> right here. And that is open. What do you see? Okay, you see there's a little line right there in that circle. It's a little decorative line. Yeah. And that one is covered in. That one is not. Hmm. So are you saying you have a counterfeit bill? No. I have one that I changed. One that you changed? That I changed. He colored it in. Did you saw what I was talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw exactly what you saw. Okay. Here's what I wrote down. Okay. I said, by logic, they're both the same since you can't legally have a counterfeit bill. That's right. That's right. Which is good for what I'm going to close with. That little mark right there, I've colored in, and that's not colored in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You see it? Now I want everybody. I want everybody to see what I'm talking about. Okay. But there is something about the the jacket, the ridges in it. I colored it in. What is new? Yeah. You could feel one of them. Why, why is this important? Why is this important? Okay, Because we know, as Larry has just said, you can't have a counterfeit bill. Okay, So which means that they are both... Legal tender. They're legal tender with one exception. One has been tainted. One has been changed. And that's what the false teachers will do. One thing... That small changes the gospel. It doesn't take much. One thing changes the gospel. And Paul was so on point that he wanted them to know what was real and what was not real, even down to the minute details. Could you add anything to the list before I wrap it up? Okay. Next week. And by the way, I'm so glad y'all are here. So glad y'all are here. Next week, we're going to fast forward three to six years, and we're going to revisit Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. It will be the first documentation to the Ephesian church since this point. We're going to look at the things he did say, 
And we're going to look at the things he didn't say, just like we did tonight. But the thing I'm going to do next week, and I hope I can blow your mind as much as it has blown mine this week, is we are going to show you four hidden verses in the book of Ephesians that's been there all along. But when you pull them out, it totally changes the complete dynamic of the entire book of Ephesians. The origins of spiritual warfare is next week. And how it comes about. Okay. Any thoughts, questions, comments before we say goodbye to our folks that have been very faithful with us online tonight? Okay. Folks, thank you all for watching. I'm going to turn the thing off, and then we will see you guys. Hey, join me first thing in the morning, 9 o'clock. Love to have you. Bye-bye, guys.